Thanks, Ben. Yeah. Uh, published early uh, this year in Nature Geoscience, uh, entitled Internal Structure of Ultra Low Velocity Zones Consistent with Origin from a Basal Magma Ocean. Uh, I'll say this is a, a, a quite uh, multidisciplinary studies involving uh, size imaging and geodynamic modeling, as well as probably uh, some geochemical and geochemistry study. Uh, so this is a list of authors. Uh, first author, Saya Pachai. Uh, second author, from, uh, uh, Dr. Ming Ming Li from the Arizona State University, and Michael Thorn from uh, University of Yoda, and uh, uh, Juan Detmer from University of Calgary, and uh, Hawaii Selkik from uh, uh, Australian National University. Uh, just a quick introduction of the first author, uh, Dr. Saya Pachai. Uh, he was originally from uh, Nepal, and he got uh, uh, his uh, Bachelor of Science and Master of Science degree in physics uh, in his home country, Nepal. And then uh, he went to Italy and got the postgraduate diploma in Earth System Physics uh, with specialty in seismology in 2010. And, and then he moved to the Southern Hemisphere and and, and then did his PhD in computational seismology between 2011 and 2012, uh, 2015 at the Australian National University. And after he got his PhD degree, he had uh, several terms of postdoc uh, appointment uh, uh, in UK, uh, University of Cambridge, and the script uh, uh, UCSD. And he's now a postdoc researcher fellow at the University of Yoda, and where I think he uh, 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 complete, completed this work. So uh, about this study, I, I would say it's uh, uh, what underlying this uh, study is, uh, it really has two pillars. One branch is just a seismology, and the other one is the geodynamics. So on, on one hand, and the authors use uh, seismology, uh, but more specifically speaking, they use the core reflected waves and, and use uh, the waveform modeling to infer the velocity, density, as well as the shape of the ULVZ. So on the other hand, and they use uh, the tools of geodynamic simulations to uh, infer the composition and uh, evolution process that best explain the seismic observations. So the uh, joint constraints from seismology and geodynamic, uh, uh, geodynamic modeling uh, thus give us a better understanding of the origin and the kind of dynamic process uh, of the ultra low velocity zones. So uh, a quick introduction of ultra low velocity zone. So this is the figure I, I found from uh, Yu and Ganaro, I think, uh, it, which summarized very nicely the, the origin as kind of uh, the complexity of the ULVZ. So uh, ULVZ, ultra low velocity zone, just uh, uh, as uh, defined by its name, is a very low velocity uh, zone residing at the base of the mantle above the core mantle boundary. And Sorry, I just want to move the, the zoom window a little bit so that I can see. So uh, the ULVZ properties uh, have been uh, examined by various studies, um, uh, primarily just the seismic studies. And this study have reported uh, a quite broad uh, range of ULVZ properties. Uh, for example, the thickness of ULVZ can vary from three to 100 kilometer. Uh, but most commonly as defined by uh, as uh, a tens of kilometer thick layer and P and S velocity reduction uh, are quite high and density can increase increase by uh, uh, up to 24%. And the lateral range of ULVZ uh, also varies quite a bit from tens of kilometers to around 900 kilometers. And it also has been suggested to have varying geometries uh, such as a boxcar, a dome and even a Gaussian shape. So, uh, a part of uh, uh, because of the uh, a, a very broad range of uh, physical properties and the origin of ULVZ have been uh, have been debated. Uh, uh, one school of thought attributes ULVZ to the high temperature anomaly, and because uh, uh, they suggested like five to thirty percent uh, partial melting can well explain the reduction in seismic velocity ratio, so P to S velocity ratio. 
And, and also because a lot of uh, ULVZ have been found beneath the surface locations or hot spots. So people may, may just uh, infer that, uh, okay, since it's uh, found beneath hot spots, so it might have something to do with temperature uh, anomaly. Uh, but more recently, and there are more and more evidence that support URVZ as a chemically altered or chemically distinct uh, compositions. So, and this study uh, suggests uh, 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 they, uh, they found uh, URVZ uh, near the edges of LS, LSVT, large low shear velocity province. And also uh, they found uh, there actually a uh, density increase inside URVZ. So uh, some of the uh, possibilities, uh, a candidate's mechanism that can explain this uh, kind of chemically uh, altered conditions include the subduction material like subducting slab and also uh, uh, the uh, chemical reactions between the mantle and the core uh, can produce some of the uh, uh, potentially can produce some of the compositional anomaly. So uh, this figure uh, is also from Yu and Ganor's work, uh, which uh, they kind of com compile the reported uh, ultra low velocity zone locations. And, and here, actually, uh, let's show you something. Uh, if everyone can see the the Googlers, so they actually. Uh, uh, Except for publish the paper, they also compile the kind of database and they saved all the data in the Google KMZ file and where you can actually load it into Google Earth and then have a detailed examination of the distribution of the ultra low velocity zone. And uh, in this map, the red area are the, are the locations uh, where the ultra low velocity zone have been reported by, by, by previous studies. Whereas the blue area are the locations where uh, no ultra low velocity zone were found, and the the yellow area are the location with ambiguities, and uh, which which means like uh, the ultra low velocity zone may or may not uh, exist. So, uh, uh, for, uh, the the actually there are quite a bit of ambiguity. For example, the black box just highlights uh, the study area uh, examined in, in this paper. Uh, as you can see that uh, it exists both red and blue regions, right? So it, which means some of the study uh, suggests the ultra low velocity zone exists, whereas some other studies do not uh, support its presence. So it's actually quite uh, uh, complex and uh, uh, debatable. So um, uh, yeah, yeah. the ultra low... Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can't just walk along the way. Uh, I, 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 I hear you, Pakari. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, uh, I don't know if the other people can hear you. Uh, oh, maybe you can you can call me later. So uh, uh, this figure just shows some of the most co commonly used sighting faces to detect an image which the ultra low velocity zones. I would say uh, seismic observation, seismic method, probably one of the most uh, fundamental methods uh, or presumably, uh, arguably the, the only method that can constrain the ultra low velocity zones. So uh, the left column shows uh, the reflection, the reflective seismic waves and the right column shows the diffractive seismic, seismic waves. Uh, here, uh, I'd like to uh, introduce a few uh, terminology first, uh, which uh, are kind of important to understand the techniques used in this paper. Now, the precursors, uh, essentially, they are just the seismics arrive before the main phase, and postcursors, uh, seismic wave arrive after the main phase. Uh, for example, uh, we can just uh, look at this figure. The SCP phase, which is the phase used in this paper, and uh, the red, uh, the, the red red segment indicates the S wave, and the blue one, the blue lines indicates the P wave. So SCP is essentially the, the downgoing S wave and hit the comment boundary and then get reflected at the CMB and, and converts into the into the P wave. So here C just stands for uh, the interface uh, comment boundary. So this is the main phase SCP. Okay. 
Uh, and so uh, due to the presence of heterogeneous structures, uh, complex structures such as uh, ultra low velocity zone, just a second, uh, such as ultra low velocity zone, you're gonna introduce some complexities in the, in the, in the waveform, to the waveforms. Uh, the precursors, uh, the second waves are right before the main phase, for example, the SDP phase, which is the phase get reflected at the top of the ultra low velocity ULVZ. And, and because its travel path is shorter than the main phase, right? So uh, the travel time is actually shorter. So it arrives earlier than the, uh, than the, uh, the main phase ICP. And similarly, um, some of the uh, post cursors, for example, the SCSP, it's kind of complex, this one, SCSP, and because it's uh, really passes longer or because the velocity, shear velocity is slower than the P wave, P wave velocity. So it actually uh, it takes more time to, uh, for, 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 for the post cursors to travel from the source to the receiver. And they arrived after the, the main phase ICP. So essentially we can use uh, the, the precursors and post cursors to infer the presence of the complex velocity structure. Uh, in this case is the presence of ULVZ. So we can basically analyze the timings and amplitudes of precursors and post cursors and to study the structures of the ULVZ. So that's basically uh, 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 how this method works. So here, here's a figure from, from their paper. And uh, they use the ICP phase. And uh, as you can see, the main phase is ICP. And we have uh, three precursory arrivals and one post precursor arrivals. And, and also what this also uh, uh, argued is, uh, is that the, the structure of ULVZ can be even more complex uh, rather than defined by a single layer structure. You can have, you can actually have like internal layering. So which means you can have, you can have an interface in the ULVZ. Uh, for example, here, if you add a layer here, uh, add an interface and you're gonna generate the reflective waves, right? So in this case, it's SUIP. And if you compare the one layer versus two layer model, uh, one layer in black and two layer in red. And you can see uh, uh, for most of the uh, regions, the waveforms looks quite similar, except for this uh, little wiggle, right? That is a reflection uh, generated uh, at this internal interface. So again, that tells us we can use the waveforms to, to study the internal structure uh, of uh, or not this internal structure, the overall structure of the ULVZ. So uh, here is uh, the cross-sectional uh, of the seismic velocity model. And what they are trying to study in, the, in this paper is the ULVZ located uh, to the Western edge of the LS, LLSVP uh, re residing beneath the Pacific plate. So, uh, here it shows the station and the event and they used in this study and they used the deep earthquakes uh, occurred in uh, Tanga Fiji subduction zone. And originally they requested uh, the data from uh, over 1200 events and because they, they kind of uh, impose very stringent uh, selection criteria uh, such as the signal to noise ratio of the data as well as the clarity of the uh, of the precursory arrivals, and uh, eventually they kept only ten out of uh, two hundred phases uh, for further waveform analysis. And this data uh, uh, were recorded by a uh, three cycling arrays uh, deployed in in, in Australia. And uh, here I'm simply just showing some Google Earth image of this array setup. Um, there's a very our famous one, uh, where Manga Array uh, deployed in Northern Central Australia. And there are a lot of papers uh, 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 have used uh, the data uh, from this network to study the, uh, 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 the deep earth structure. And also in, in my, during, during my postdoc uh, in Australia, I have used like all, all of this data to study the continental, uh, which is mainly the lithospheric structure of, of the Australian continent. Okay. So this slide shows some waveform examples 
uh, oh, I think I forgot to mention here. Yeah, so sorry. Uh, they, uh, they, they kind of uh, discretize the study region or parameterize the study region uh, into uh, 10 different areas or 10 different bins and based on the location of the reflection point. So this blue dot indicates the reflection points uh, of the SCP phase. So uh, based on the, their locations, they, they simply just uh, group them, categorize them into 10 different bins. And the background color here shows the velocity uh, at the core mental boundary or lower mental, I believe. So essentially uh, different bins, they kind of sample different structures from uh, uh, high to, to low velocities. So this, the, the order of the bin uh, essentially just uh, uh, ordered by the uh, velocity variation. So it's from high to one stand for like high velocity and 10 means like uh, the lowest velocity. So, so those are the waveforms for different bins and the black uh, waveforms are the uh, individual waveforms from different stations. And the bottom one, the blue ones, is the stacked waveforms, uh, which essentially is kind of typical techniques used by seismologists. Because for the individual waveforms, you see a lot of wiggles, right? And some of them are just a noise rather than the real signal. So what we normally do is we stack, essentially sum up all the individual waveform to produce a sum trace or stack trace. And that can help us to, to, to cancel out the noise and improve the coherency or, or boost the amplitude of useful signal. So it's a very typical techniques, uh, a ray technique uh, used by seismologists. So uh, for this 10 bins, uh, the, uh, the, high, the, the, the most obvious phase is the, uh, uh, the SCP phase. And we can see the uh, precursor arrivals in majority of the bins. For example, bin number four, it's kind of clear. But for some of them, it's a precursor arrival is, is kind of weak. For example, bin number five and probably bin number 10. So uh, the author uh, later used the, uh, based on this waveform, the author used a technique, uh, it's, it's called inversion, inversion technique which essentially to, to try to fit the waveforms based on certain uh, uh, velocity uh, model and and then to infer the structure of, of the constraint structure of your VZ. So conventionally, the waveform modeling is done by the so-called try and error approach. So which essentially is just like a grid search approach. So here is a, is a figure uh, from Rose et al. 2006 nature paper. Uh, so they use the same phase, SCP. Uh, what they do is they uh, parameterize the ULVZ uh, using four different parameters, which is the alpha uh, P wave velocity, beta uh, shear wave velocity, D is the thickness, thickness of, uh, of the ULVZ, uh, as, as well as, I think, uh, density, a density role. Yeah, so, so basic four parameters, and then they use a grid search method to systemat systematically vary uh, these four parameters. And, and then uh, for a given mo uh, parameter combination, they generate, they run this, uh, the synthetic simulation to generate the synthetic waveforms, which is shown by this uh, uh, thin lines. And the bottom line is the uh, observed waveform. Um, and by wearing these uh, parameters and doing the research, and they, they try to see which model of a parameter combination can best explain, can best fit the observed waveforms. So th this two uh, subplots essentially show the research result. I, I believe the, the light color means uh, the better fit. So it, essentially you are trying to, to see uh, which kind of model parameter uh, can give you the best fit. And that is uh, uh, based on their uh, their their uh, their result, and this suggests uh, uh, about the uh, 8.5 kilometer thick ULVZ with P and S re velocity reductions of eight and 25 percent, respectively, and density reduction uh, dens density increase by 10 percent, and it can lead to the best fit between the observed and the uh, synthetic waveforms. So this is kind of conventional uh, trial and error approach to do the waveform modeling. Uh, 
in, in this study, um, the author, uh, they used an improved approach, uh, which is uh, based on the Bayesian Bayesian inference uh, inference and, and to do the to do the uh, immersion for modeling. So the Bayesian uh, the Bayesian inference is is uh, closely related to the Bayesian theorem. Uh, essentially, uh, the term on the left hand side of the equation is a posterior probability, uh, which is a probability of getting a model M. Uh, given the uh, observed data D, okay? And then this term is uh, proportional to the uh, uh, probab uh, prior probability and PK and PMKK. And these are essentially the model parameter. Here K stands for the number of layers. And in their paper, I think they used, uh, they set this parameter from one to four, which means they, uh, the ULVZ can have one to four uh, uh, layers. And M is the model parameter uh, that consists of thickness, P velocity, S velocity, and density. So uh, the PK and, and, and this term are the uh, likelihood of, uh, of obtaining this kind of model parameter and times the conditional probability, or also it's called likelihood function. That is uh, the uh, uh, likelihood of get observed data uh, given uh, uh, given the, the model parameters k and m k. Okay, so this is basically just a, the Bayesian theorem. So uh, this is because this is a highly nonlinear equation, so it's uh, it's uh, kind of uh, uh, difficult to solve with conventional method. So. What they use is the RGMCMC method, which is essentially just a nonlinear inversion method. And there are three operations or three moves in this method, uh, which is termed birth, death, and perturbation. So here, birth means you 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 uh, you you add a layer, you add a new layer. It's kind of a give birth to a new layer. And then death means you 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 remove a layer, get rid of a layer. So you reduce the number of layers. And perturbation move means you change the property of, of, of uh, you change this model, prime, uh, model property, thickness, P velocity, S velocity, and density, okay? So uh, uh, this method actually originally developed by the first author uh, in his uh, 2014 JGR paper. So if you have interest in more technical details of, of this method, so you could refer to this paper. So which essentially, I, 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 I attribute it just a, you know, a, a better uh, immersion, a great search method, immersion method to, uh, to get the model parameter. So uh, here showing the uh, modeling result and uh, the X axis at the uh, shear velocity perturbation and density perturbation and the Y axis indicates the height above the CMB, which is essentially the thickness uh, of the ULVZ. So the authors, they uh, categorize their modeling results into two different groups uh, as shown here. So the for, for type one, group one, uh, they uh, it's a multi-layered, uh, well-constrained ULVZs. And the type two, uh, which are uh, circled uh, by, by this kind of right circles and type two, uh, the multi-layered weakly constrained ULVZs. Uh, as you can see, the, the, the color here indicates the probability of getting this model's uh, parameter. So the darker color means you have higher probability to have such and such uh, combination, combination in height, uh, velocity, and, and density of uh, uh, perturbations. Uh, so for, for type one, you can see the uh, you, you have well-focused uh, energy or probability. So they are kind of small, right? And for type two, uh, you have very uh, kind of blurred uh, uh, probability, but blurred uh, energy. So you have a kind of wider distribution. So uh, which means uh, the result is inversion result is not well constrained. So let's have a, a, a general uh, understanding of uh, the kind of modeling result. And first uh, for type one, we see a kind of a, a velocity decrease uh, with depth. So which means at, at shallower depths, you have higher shear velocity. And as depth increases, the velocity decreases. 
uh, the trend of uh, density variation is just opposite. So, so the density increases with the depth. And then let's have a look at the, uh, the modeling result of two bins in, in more detail. Uh, it's about the same as the previous slide, except for it adding like p velocity perturbation and uh, also the the kind of probability of uh, of the height above the same b. So for bin number one, uh, which is located in the high velocity area, so it uh, the optimal solution has uh, a layer thickness of about three kilometers, and and the velocity perturbation up to. Uh, 40, 50 percent of uh, velocity reduction, uh, as well as like uh, 10 percent or so uh, uh, density increase. And this is the uh, waveform fit. So I can see the waveform is a waveform fit is actually quite good. And the edge of the LLSVPs and the thickness of ULVZ increases to uh, 15 kilometer. And the PS uh, velocity perturbation is uh, is about fifty percent, fifty percent shear velocity reduction, and the density perturbation uh, is about the same as as the bin number one. And this one is a bit different because uh, this one actually shows uh, uh, more clear uh, precursors compared to the waveform from uh, from um, from bin number one, I don't know if that's a reason why it has better constrained uh, shear velocity perturbation. Okay, so uh, another important, uh, I think, uh, observation from their study is uh, the thickness of ULVZ is thicker at the uh, near the edge of the LLSVP, whereas. Uh, you have uh, uh, the thickness uh, thins towards the interior and outside the LSMVP. So this is kind of a com conclusion, important conclusion of this paper, and, and we'll come back to that point later. So that's the sizing observation part, sizing, size, sizing part. And then the, uh, the, the authors conduct the geodynamic modeling uh, and trying to uh, explain some of the sizing observations. And what they did is they, they set up a geodynamic model and by uh, parameterized the uh, lower mantle uh, LSVP, uh, which is a region uh, 40 and uh, from 40 to 200 kilometers above CMB. And they use density, uh, I, I think this is a density increase and density set the density to 1.5% uh, higher than the ambient mantle. And the uh, ULVZ is defined from zero to 40 kilometers about uh, CMB. And then the density increases exponentially from 1.5% to 15% near the CMB compared to the ambient mantle. And then they add the mantle flow and boundary condition and let the model run for 4.5 uh, billion years. And, and let's have a look at the, I don't know if you can play the video. Okay, so this is kind of a long video. So it's about like a minute or so. I don't know if I can. Okay, I cannot control this thing. So yeah, you, you have the, the kind of mental convection and then you have this kind of large pile of uh, LSVZ. I, I think this is a temperature field and this is a, a the buoyancy, re residual buoyancy, which, uh, which is a, uh, kind of a, indicator of the density density field. And then you have this kind of formation of ULVZ. And it's pushed by the mantle flow to the edge of the uh, LLSVP. And then it, it, it remains stable for, for a long time. And it forms this kind of triangular shape at the edge of the LLSVP. Okay, yeah, I'm just uh, 
stop here, stop here. Uh, and then let's have a data look at uh, three uh, time step of the simulation. So they, they uh, here, uh, let's, this time refilled and this is a residual buoyancy. And let's look at uh, the, uh, uh, figure B. So here, one and two are just a zoom in plot of uh, the, uh, the two corners of the LSVP and, and, and focus on the uh, ULVZ. So uh, there are several important observations from Jordan modeling. Uh, and first, it's, it's located near the edge of LSVP, which is kind of obvious. And, and second, it has this kind of triangular shape. Right? It's uh, thinner uh, near, near the edges and it's thicker in, uh, in the center of the LVZ. And another important observation uh, is uh, conclusion from the Jordan modeling is the magnitude of negative buoyancy increases with the depth. So uh, for example, here, as we can see, the color uh, is changing from the kind of bluish greenish color to the reddish color, right? So that, that is the magnitude of uh, the negative buoyancy is, uh, is increasing uh, with depth. Uh, another important conclusion is uh, uh, they, they actually uh, had three simulations. This is just the first uh, model run. And then they also changed the density of density contrast, then dens density contrast between the ULVZ and ambient mandal uh, to make it smaller. And also the, uh, they reduced the viscosity of ULVZ material. And, and then they found that it actually leads to smaller density variation. And this kind of makes sense because you have smaller density contrast or you have low viscosity. You're gonna speed up the, the mixing of the mental material, right? Everything is uh, becoming more homogeneous in this case. Okay. And, and then um, based on the seismic and the geodynamic uh, uh, seismic observations, modeling work and geodynamic simulation, they proposed uh, this hypothetical model to explain everything. So. They, they basically just attributed to the remnants of crystallized uh, basal magma ocean. So in, in this model, uh, the magma uh, initially just uh, crystallized in the middle of the magma ocean. And, 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 and then uh, uh, the uh, depletion of the kind of light, light material such as the silicon, uh, uh, essentially, uh, and then uh, it has, uh, uh, I think the, the residual is just an iron rich, uh, uh, iron rich magma. And this actually can cause some uh, density, uh, density uh, difference. And you have more iron, so it can make sense to have a higher density uh, uh, at, at greater depths. And except for the, uh, the kind of a, a crystallization, other materials such as the subducted uh, oceanic, uh, uh, oceanic plate, and can also introduce this kind of uh, heterogeneity and to the to the to the core mental boundary and which can potentially cause uh, the uh, competition anomaly. And the figure D uh, is if you just to summarize the cycling observations. You have this kind of a large variation in the uh, thickness of the ultra low velocity uh, ultra low velocity zones, and you have a uh, uh, thinner uh, ULVZ uh, near the uh, near a uh, uh, Thicker, thicker ULVZ near the edge of the LSVP, and then it sinks towards interior and outside the, uh, the LSVP. So that, that's basically the model and they propose to explain uh, everything. So, uh, okay, so in summary, I think there are uh, uh, three key conclusions uh, or, or take home message in this, uh, in this study. The first one is, uh, uh, we can invert it for the core reflect waves uh, to, to, to obtain uh, the structures uh, uh, of the ULVZ. And they also found uh, the stratified uh, ULVZ uh, with 30% uh, density increase and 50% uh, shear velocity decrease can well explain the seismic observation. And then the Dynamic modeling work uh, indicates that the seismic observations can be explained by, by the compositionally distinct materials. And, and finally, uh, the authors attribute the ULVZs to the remnants of early uh, of Earth's early differentiation. And they also suggest they are the uh, uh, long-lived features that can persist throughout Earth's history for more than like 
from five million years. Yeah, I think that's uh, that's about it. So I'll just stop it here. No, Brian, go, go ahead. Oh, I will say what John Joe was about to say. Thank you for your summary. Thank you, Um Yeah, I have two two general questions. One is more general, and yeah. one's more technical. Uh, the more general question is: Have have others tried to resolve the shape of the U ULVZ? ULVZ. Yeah. Yeah, there are yeah tens tens of papers. Um, did the same thing using different uh, size imaging techniques. For example, here, right, you have this kind of a, a, a polygon with different shapes. Yes. And you have this also kind of lines, right? So those are the coordinate boundaries sampled by different size faces. What about like the, the depth, the, the topographic shape? of the ULVCs, because it seems like here mm -hmm. the main uh, novelty is being able to saying being able that they can resolve, you know, the the topographic feature, the, the little triangular shape of the ULVZ. Has that been uh, before? Yeah, it has been it has been done before. But uh, I think the novelty of this one is uh, uh, those those authors, I think in their er uh, earlier paper, they propose like the ULVZ can have an internal layering. So rather than like explained by a simple single layer structure, you can actually have multiple layers. Uh, let's see. Oh, maybe it's this one. This one. So yeah. So the the essentially they they suggest that ULVZ, the structure of ULVZ can be even more complex. Right. Yeah, but there are tens of papers uh, studied uh, the geometry, the shape of URV this using different uh, sizing faces. So in your opinion, uh, the, the main um, contribution here is uh, being able to have a way to invert for the number of layers? Uh, or has that also uh, been- I before? think that is one. Yeah, that, that's why yeah. also they, I think they give up probabilities. Right, to, 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 to basically get an idea of which model is more likely to be true rather than right, because, right. Uh, the previous works uh, kind of, uh, you know, subjective. So essentially you just uh, tune the parameters and to see which one can explain the waveform, uh, can, can, can best fit the observed waveform. But there are maybe tens of models that can uh, fit the model, uh, fit the waveform equally well. So there is a kind of a subjective uh, subjectiveness in, in this uh, process. Yeah, I have to look at the details a little bit more, but I mean, Bay Bayesian methods aren't necessarily immune from subjectivity as well. It can be highly affected by yeah. Uh, yeah. choice of prior and the yeah, prior the yeah. Yeah. of uh, data. data uncertainties, which leads to my second question. Like how, mm -hmm. how what's the normal precision for the, for those seismic waveforms you're showing? Um, like how how much is like the noise floor versus the features that you generally tend to see after stacking? Uh, I think they're referring to this one. Any anyone? You can even do the one layer versus two layer. That one works too. Uh, well, they didn't specifically assess the noise level in their in their in their paper. Then what they did is uh, they simply take the difference between the observed and synthetic waveform, so essentially yes. the residue, the the misfit, the misfit between the observation and synthetic, and use that as an indi indi indication uh, indicator of uh, noise level. So you have a good fit, then the noise level is is kind of small. And then if you have vice versa, if you have bad fit, then it, it actually has a higher higher, higher noise level. But yeah, nope. I mean, I think what, was, what they, um, more like prescribed known beforehand, the, the kind of noise level. Because if you say, if you basically prescribe that I have very low mm -hmm. noise, then it will put most of the samples 
that uh, to yeah. models that really, really fit the data very well. Mm -hmm. So I, I worry, mm -hmm. or, I mean, I'm, I'm just curious, like, is there a chance yeah. of overfitting? So is it possible to overfit so, you know, every little bump in the waveform yeah. such that that yeah. transmits yeah. Yeah. into um, topographic features? Yeah, they, they, they mentioned that in the paper. So they what they did is treat the noise level as unknown. Oh, okay, okay. So they saw for the noise yeah. level. So they saw for noise level as well. Right, right, right. Yeah, you, right. yeah, you, if you, yeah, I also use the uh, RGMC code a little bit for the cross imaging. Yeah, I yeah. found it, yes, it, it has a lot to do with the noise level as a sigma term, like uh, yeah. uh, in, the, in the inversion. Yeah. So yeah, it, it's kind of subject to choice as well. I, I agree. <laughs> Yeah, because in one of those, one of your slides, uh, I think it was titled "Comparison of Two Bins." Uh, you can see that in one of the one of the bins, it fits pretty well the observed waveform yeah. on all times, and then in the other one, it doesn't fit well. I mean, it fits yeah. like the, see the first one, it's it fits far. like the middle, the middle peaks a lot better, and then it kind of doesn't fit the precursors mm -hmm. and postcursors, whereas the second yeah. one does. Um, so yeah, yeah. Just, I'm sure there's a reason for it, probably in terms of the model resolution or something. But uh, to me, it's a little, it's just, it, yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm, for me, it's unclear. Like, how do I know which one to interpret more? Which one of those wiggles is more yeah. substantial than the other? <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Which one is uh, more trustworthy features in the waveform? Yeah, that, that's, uh, yeah that's kind of a tricky question, I would say. Yeah. Uh, I, I think the other way, if you, you know, uh, uh, really uh, get the, uh, the noise levels from the data, what I, I think what you can do is uh, based on the consistency of the waveforms. The more consistent features are more likely to be useful signal, whereas uh, the kind of random features are, are, the, are the noise. So I don't know uh, if you can just uh, calculate the standard standard deviations of the of the of the data. Right. 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 Yeah. And, and are, are these performed on um, independently for each bin? Like it's doing an MCMC run for each bin, and it doesn't know anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They 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 actually use the one D. The treat is the one D model. So oh, they right. inverted the ball velocity structure model 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 for each bin. Yeah, I think it's uh, <laughs> to me. Yeah, you can do a two D inversion if you have a powerful computer. Okay. Okay. Yeah, because it's kind of uh, computationally expensive. So yeah, yeah, well, that's what they mentioned in the paper. So they use one D, and they, they but they did uh, did they did some tests, and and to justify the the, the kind of uh, 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 the one D versus two D, I think they they did that, and they suggested that the one D inversion actually is good enough to to constrain the velocity structure. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. If I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Yeah, I think they also like like you said they did a really rigorous or stringent selection of the waveforms that would most likely fit the one D model the best. There's something along those lines. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that's yeah, that's... yeah, yeah. They did some quality control. Yeah. They, right. well, you, you can you can tell from the lens of their subvention material. I'd be surprised, except for the extended uh, data figure or something. They also has a uh 11 or 17 figures supplementary figures so that's a lot of materials for to, to put a lot of effort to put in, in one single paper yeah yeah and yeah. everything in supplementary that's those are nature and science papers for you <laughs> yeah okay uh okay actually i'm going to add a lot of uh Comments, uh, flying over that are other people last one's mine. So, okay, probably we we'll start this one. So, I think this is a one comment is related to, yeah, anyway, it's fine. Uh, I think, uh, yeah, you, you, you could you move, move, move back to, uh, oh, it's fine. I think this one is okay. Uh, uh, so, uh, one comment is about Ming Li's uh, contribution. Uh, that's his uh, work over the years, if my recollection is correct, he 
then the URV doesn't have to be the map motion, but uh, some data slabs are okay. Uh, uh, because as long as it has some dense components, uh, they, uh, 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 because he has done a lot of work on the shape of the piece, and also look at how the URV is that in being alone. Because it is basically a fundamental convection that pushes the shape of the uh, geometry of the LCP piece. And uh, in my reflection, that he did one work before that, including some of the slabs, and looking at those URVZs that are just like those balls that are running around at the bottom of the uh, mm -hmm. LCP piece that always occur at the edge. So, so by that, it doesn't yeah. matter if it's mag motion or not, at least in this case, uh, from the geodynamic perspective. So I don't think that it's a uh, unique solution uh, in terms of that. So this one thing. So could you move to the uh, one or three slides earlier or whatever? Uh, uh, yeah, uh, earlier. Uh, uh, oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, 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 I, I think, yeah, a global one, a global one. Uh, the, the position of the LC, uh, ULVZs uh, is global distribution. Oh, the map? Okay. Yeah, yeah, that's like them. Hi. So for that, uh, I had a conversation with uh, uh, Edward Gennaro in his office in early 2019. And actually, at that time, I think he was, he just accomplished uh, earlier paper on LCVPs and also this one. Uh, no, 2018 probably this was at time of this work is that mm -hmm. he told me that before people only uh, uh, let's say draw with the illustrator and a core draw about the location of LCVPs and URVCs. So he said that he, he and his students read a paper that put the real longitude and latitude about the position of the <laughs> this anomalies. So 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 it's great. That's how it should that. Uh, Google Earth is really yeah. beautiful. So people know where exactly yeah. they are. And, yeah. and also, the you, you can find it from the GitHub online repository, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, this one. This one. Yeah, this uh, is really no, nice. No, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, uh, this is really uh, nice. No, not this one. Yeah, they, they are, uh, uh, they, yeah. yeah. Uh, that's, that's the okay. work. That's a very nice summary of, uh, of the previous work, right? Yeah. Yeah, and uh, uh, yeah, I, I, I think more or less a global model is still needed because uh, different models are not self might not be self are not con self consistent with each other in some locations. And then I think another comment is from uh, 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 Tastomo uh, who gave a talk here, and uh, when Professor Chamba invited him, and I happened to be the host. Uh, so actually, I asked him about the ULVZ on that day. In the summer, uh, so his opinion is that he thinks the ULVZ is caused by the subdata slab. Um, so uh, he said that because of that we need to measure the melting temperature of basalt at the core mantle boundary pressure very accurately, and he has the ability to do so, and he's pushing for that limit. So it's very likely, at least, it is possible that as long as you have a subdata slab. Going near the core or the core mountain boundary, its, its mountain temperature is significantly lower than what is temperature available at the core mountain boundary. So you have a very large proportion of um, uh, uh, basalt melting, so that you have some uh, dense melt that existing there uh, and it's pushing around uh, by the uh, by the convection. So shaping what is mm -hmm. uh, ULVZ. Um, now, but if that is the case, then the but we have to answer that question, which is based on my comment here, which is quite, uh, I think it's quite interesting to me, is that will these people find the uh, stratifying layer in terms of composition of all disease, uh, which to me that suggests melt have to be involved because if everything is a solid mm -hmm. uh, at the very beginning, then by the mechanical mixing, you cannot have this uh, uh, composition layers exist. So, uh, have the melt at the very beginning and crystallize uh, this one way. Another way is, of course, you could introduce the partial melt, uh, uh, like I said, by subduction. Mm -hmm. Of course, you don't have mm -hmm. to with the core equipment of composition melt. So mm -hmm. it's, it's a good uh, indicator for petrologists and the geodynamists that they have something different here. Uh, so, mm -hmm. so, 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 so my my interest is that, uh, like I say, you see that globally. If that's case, regular visits, and so that's LZPs. Well, though, 
the composition differentiation probably is much less. Uh, uh, but the composition gradient is uh, should be much less than that of your obvious case because we don't we could not expect a global scale of melting for LSVPs because uh, it's just too large and uh, uh, further away okay. you are from from the boundary, uh, the relative temperature you are with the ambient matter is much smaller. Uh, so so I think there's something on my part and. Uh, uh, yeah, I think final comment is uh, I heard uh, I called another guy. Uh, he was working in Denmark, and he was uh, the president of the EGU. And they once used the nuclear weapon data from Soviet Union, and they could image the Earth come on the boundary. And they also look at the uh, layer, uh, look at the layer structure view of these. So, so mm -hmm. actually, I have a quick question uh, uh, because I'm laboring in seismology. Is that uh, as how uh, how powerful that are these different methods in detecting your disease? Uh, we know that for nuclear weapons, that is a really powerful source and controlled. But for all this, I say methods using natural earthquakes, where you don't know the exact location of earthquakes, uh, so, so how confident are or, or, or what other uncertainties that could exist here? Uh, uh, I think in, the, in this paper, uh... Uh, this will actually summarize very nicely different methods. Uh, different methods, of course, have their own pros and cons. And for example, if you use the reflection, reflective waves, you have higher uh, resolution because uh, it's kind of just a sample point on the chromatic boundary, right? You have a reflection point here. Uh, 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 whereas for the diffractive waves, because they propagate along the chromatic boundary, so you can sample a relatively larger area compared to reflective waves. But of course, in that case, you have uh, lower resolution because it just samples, uh, you know, uh, it's kind of integrated effect, right? So all these structures in this area along the repass can, can affect the side waves. So that yeah, actually uh, uh, a bit different. Also, you can, you can tell from, from this figure. So the lines, I think they are sampled by the refracted waves, like this one. So you have rays, uh, just a size of wave propagating along the common boundary. There are these dots, they are the reflection point. That's a common boundary sampled by the refracted wave. For the nuclear weapon, I, I don't know if this is a good choice because uh, as, as uh, suggested by this study, they use deep earthquake. So earthquakes uh, with epicenter uh, deeper than 80 kilometers, because that can actually help you to uh, get, rid of, get rid of some interfering phases. So you have a, a more clear uh, precursors or, or, or main rivals or post, post cursors. So that actually helped help uh, uh, help a little bit. So I don't know about nuclear weapon because it's at the surface or a closer surface, it may introduce some complexity to the to the to the waveforms. Okay. Uh, actually, one last comment is that uh, okay. I, I, I for Soya when he did his postdoc, uh, I did postdoc at Scripps for more than two years. So he happened to mm -hmm. arrive after after me and left earlier than me. So I haven't seen his two years there. And uh, yeah, he was working mm -hmm. among the most uh, with Guy Masters. So I think he should have publication coming out at some point. And also on the deep. Uh, mental structure. Uh, okay, so and there's a question from Dong Hao. I'm asking for his behalf. Uh, uh, Yun Feng could uh, answer. And uh, so he has, uh, Dong Hao is asking how does the convection is initiated in the animation? You notice that the origin state and mental command boundary seem quite homogeneous. Uh, so asking about that. Uh, yeah, yeah. You're talking about the uh, kind of details of geodynamic modeling. I, I'm not expert in this field, and they <laughs> they, they 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 probably provide some details in in their earlier paper, but not in this paper. Probably add some boundary conditions. That's uh, how I yeah. That's my that's my guess. But I adding some. Have, yeah, I think don't have. I think they have the let's say temperature. Uh, let's say in. I don't know, actually, I, I don't know either. But I suppose that because there is a temperature difference there, and then uh, I think the beginning part, uh, okay, so there, 
they have, I, I, from my understanding, though, they introduced the temperature uh, gradient into the system and they correlate the temperature with density. Uh, I said, let's forget about the graph basis because uh, that's not the reason of the magnetic convection. So, so when you have that, then basically it's the density driven process that is going on. Uh, although, uh, let's say, uh, but whether it's a, te it's a temperature induced density uh, uh, driven activity, but the, I don't know how well the Mandel convection theory definitely is not plate tectonics as what we are uh, thinking uh, of the current one. It's, uh, it looks like that, it's a bit odd, weird stuff going on. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but it's a less a global Mandel convection particles is mainly driven yeah. by temperature. It's a temperature induced yeah. so that's my understanding. Yeah, I think you need to check. The, you can check the code. It's SICOM. It's a it's open source code, or check some of the earlier publication by Ming and Li and 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 their group. Yeah, I'm I'm just wondering why it's, it's an open source code, but uh, uh, it seems that there's quite few people can know how to use this code. Yes, yeah, really the Fortran. Uh, yeah, I don't know. It's a very small community that uh, is in that of time. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, maybe one day they should all write reading Python. So we have a lot of packages. <laughs> so easy for people to use. Yeah, great. Yeah. Okay, any questions from our other participants today? Okay, I think by that, uh, uh, thank you to Yunfeng for leading the discussion. And uh, let's wait the speaker on Wednesday to hear more details. Maybe he's going, also going to talk some normal words, I suppose, uh, uh, relevant to this demand structure. And then we will, the next speaker will be like the three, four weeks later. So I think on uh, October 19th. So, so we'll are, we are take a break from reading for about three weeks. Uh, here, of course, on the National Holiday. Okay, by that, uh, thanks okay. to yeah. and uh, everyone for your participation. Uh, could everyone open your video so that we could see each other's face uh, for one minute and then uh, we could close the video. Okay, uh, see, uh, see everyone on this.